Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending upon where you're watching from. Thank you for being with us tonight or this afternoon. On behalf of our leadership team, Zev, Mel, Rabbi Chasen, and Caroline, a spe and a special, um, we especially welcome and thank tonight's guest, Frank Four, and of course, our moderator, Madeline Brand. We all look forward to hearing about the inner workings of the Biden White House from someone who has more knowledge than most, and certainly from any of <clears throat> any of us. Tonight is our final program of 2023. We had 60 programs this year with between three and 6,000 people attending each program. Thank you for your continuing loyalty and your interest in following the news and getting the very best analysis of what's going on. We will kick off the new year with three important programs in the first two weeks of 2024. On January 3rd, we welcome back the former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen, who will give his perspective on the wars in Ukraine and Gaza and let us know it, what his thoughts about a future peace could be. On Tuesday, January 9th, we will host Ambassador Dennis Ross once again to share his analysis of the Israel-Hamas war and developments in the region with our seventh Israel in crisis briefing since the war began. Then on Wednesday, January 10th, we welcome Boston College American history professor Heather Cox Richardson. Richardson is a wildly popular, in fact, she is the most popular blogger on the email newsletter platform Substack. She has millions of followers, me among them. Each night I get Cox Richardson's post at about 11 p.m. LA time in her blog called Letters from an American. She sums, sums up the news of the day and adds in interesting observation, observations based upon her expansive understanding of history. You can be a free or paid subscriber. I recommend it. You can sign up for all three of these programs in the email you'll get at the end of tonight's program. As we close out 2023, we can all agree it has been an extraordinarily difficult year. Aside from all the global and domestic trauma in the form of wars, mass shootings, a dysfunctional Congress, a massive rise in anti-Semitism, and the shocking continued pop popularity of a certain past president, and, of course, the horror of October 7th and the continuing holding by Hamas of more than 135 hostages. On top of all of that, we suffered the profound loss of our partner, the beloved David Lehrer. His life was a blessing, a blessing which touched every member of our audience, and we continue to grieve his untimely and unexpected passing. As we anticipate 2024, we know that there will be immense challenges in Eastern Europe and the Middle East and right here with the presidential elections. You can continue to count on America at a crossroads to bring you programs with outstanding informed guests to help us all prepare for what lies ahead. Thank you for your support, your generosity, and for your curiosity and thirst for knowledge. For those in our audience who celebrate Christmas, Kwanzaa, or other holidays which come this month, we wish you joyous celebrations with your family and friends. And to everyone in our audience, we wish you a very happy new year. We will come back in January stronger than ever, ready to face a tough year with resolve and enthusiasm. And now please welcome my friend, my colleague, a member of our America at a Crossroads leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine. Mel? Hi, Janice. Thank you very, very much. And uh, I share your gratitude to our audience, and um, it's a real pleasure to have been working with you and Zev and our departed friend David for not only this year, but the several years be before it. Uh, David actually was the person who thought about doing these Zoom calls, and who would have imagined that we'd still be doing them with the size of the audience that we have every single week? Um, this evening, we have the privilege of hearing from Frank Four. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Rabbi Bill Cutter for putting us together with Frank. Um, Frank Four is a staff writer at The Atlantic, and he's a former editor of The New Republic. Uh, he has written a number of books. If my math is right, the first book that he wrote, I think he did before he was 30 years old, uh, a book entitled How Soccer Explains the World. Uh, his next book is one that intrigues me. I admit that I haven't read it yet, but I'm now determined to do so. It was entitled Jewish Jocks, an Unorthodox Hall of Fame. 
Uh, I know that one of them is Sandy Koufax. That's enough to get me to read the book. Uh, and there are others as well in a variety of sports. Uh, he also wrote World Without Mind, the Existential Threat Coming from Big Tech. And this year, his most recent publication, which is why we've invited him this evening, uh, is a book entitled The Last Politician Inside uh, Joe Biden's White House and the Struggle uh, for American, uh, America's Future. Uh, I read that book and I, I couldn't put it down. Um, I thought that Frank was able to get into subtleties, uh, depth. Uh, it, it was clear that he spent an enormous amount of time with the people closest to the president. And I'm, I believe he spent some time with the president himself. And one gets a, a really uh, inside uh, perspective on the president and his presidency by reading that book. I recommend it to our audience. Um, Frank will be interviewed by our wonderful interviewer, Madeline Brand. Uh, Madeline is an American broadcast journalist and uh, a radio personality. She's host of the uh, news and culture show Press Play on KCRW. Um, uh, she has taught documentary broadcast journalism uh, and has received uh, more awards than one can count. Uh, Madeline, um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. That was a very generous introduction, and it's great to be back with you. And I, too, share your enthusiasm for the book because I really enjoyed it. It was really, um, Frank, dare I say, chattily written. In a good <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, very easy to read and um, yeah. you feel like you're a fly on the wall, uh, which I, mean, I, I, I when I wrote it, I I tried to actually put the focus on po policy because I wasn't writing about Donald Trump. I was not writing about a lunatic. I wasn't writing about somebody who was commanding people to drink bleach. I was writing about people who kind of came into the middle of a pandemic and were trying to do serious policy. And really, one of the things that I tried to do was. I believe that the business of government is actually one of the most interesting things in the world. And I tried to write about it in a way that kind of conveyed the energy, the tension, the drama of making policy, making foreign policy. Yeah. And I guess hard to do in a way that, you know, we, we're all living this, right? So this just happened in the last two years. So we probably remember a lot of these incidents. So I guess I'm wondering how you try to you know, bear that in mind that we know what you're talking about because a lot of us here are avid news consumers with also giving us the sense that we haven't heard this story before. Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, the Biden White House is both not great for journalism at large, but very good for book writers because there are all these things that happen that are of world historic importance but they're a lockbox. They don't actually, Biden himself, and I think the people around, Biden himself really doesn't enjoy the kind of the sausage making stories, which we in journalism call the TikTok. And so mm -hmm. it felt like these massive things happened. And so if I could just kind of get inside the room and tell the story of how they happened, that was my opportunity. Okay, so I want to quote what you wrote in the preface, because um, I, I just want you to elaborate on this. You write that you initially viewed Biden as a, quote, bloviator who dangerously fetishized bipartisanship. And then a few that paragraphs- That doesn't sound very nice. <laughs> no, and then and then I think, I think this is a compliment because then you switch <laughs> at the end and you say, uh, unheroic but honorably human, he will be remembered as the old hack who could. Yeah. So not exactly like a, a complimentary description, an old hack who could. Um, but I, I think, you know, reading the, your book, you ha do have an enormous amount of respect for what he has accomplished. I think in a way, what I was describing in the arc of those two sentences that you read was that my feelings towards him had changed, that mm -hmm. I had looked at him initially as somebody, when I first talked to Joe Biden, I was 24 years old. I was a cub reporter and I got him on the phone. He was the senator from Delaware. And five minutes into the conversation, I was like, oh my God, I'm never giving this guy off the phone. 
It's like, <laughs> He's just going to go on forever. He's going to tell story after story. And even though I'm not a veteran, I've heard these stories before. Um, so I was like, oh my God, he's never going to shut up. And then as I've watched him up close with my face pressed against the window of government, my view of him has changed. That, And in part, I know you wanted to ask me maybe about the title of my book, but my book is really about politics. And that politics is something that's so disrespected in our culture and that you know, the two presidents who came before Joe Biden, both Obama and Trump in their own ways, presented themselves as anti-politicians. They disdained the system. They wanted to break the system. Joe Biden, you say whatever you want about him, he's a politician. And our culture has, you know, the first joke I ever heard, uh, I was able to tell, I would botch it usually, it was one about a guy who walks into a used brain store. And it turns out the most expensive brain was the one that belonged to the politician because it was hardly ever used. And so we have this sense like the politician, and it's like the way that we think about Joe Biden. Joe Biden yeah. is this cheesy cornball guy who tells these stories, but watching him up close and watching kind of how he executed politics as a profession, the way in which he thought about somebody's he was able to get in the heads of foreign leaders or the people he was negotiating with. And he was able to think about their interest and how he could get to a deal with them. He really loved his deal making, um, the way in which he could understand their ambitions and their psychology. And his whole theory of the case as president was that he could save democracy by proving that politics was still capable of delivering big, important things for, for the citizenry. And I think the public doesn't really appreciate that now, judging by the polling numbers, but in fact, he's done that. So the book is called The Last Politician. So you think he's the last one to do that? Will well, I think that off? he's, so there were, there were a couple of reasons I said that. One is uh, he's definitely somebody who comes from this uh, this other time with this different cultural attitude towards the profession. He believed in all these things that were con considered antiquated, that the his faith in deal-making and negotiation and the necessity of compromise, which is not the same thing as bipartisanship per se. I don't think that he actually, this is something I missed about him. I don't think that he especially fetishizes bipartisanship, but he believes that it's possible to deal with your political adversaries and it's kind of imperative to deal with your political adversaries and to do the best that you can by pushing them as far as they're willing to go and kind of taking what you can get when you can find a place where there's some overlap i mean one way because, in which you i guess i'm wondering if he still believes that when it comes to the republican party like in your book his main adversary is really joe manchin in their friends and yet they're fighting over legislation and Joe Manchin ends up being basically the guy who will make or break his presidency in your telling of it. But he, how does he view MAGA Republicans? Like, does he think he can work with them at all? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think when Kevin McCarthy was speaker, he thought that he could work with Kevin McCarthy. He didn't even know if he could work with Kevin McCarthy. I mean, I, there's a, this is not, within the, the book, but it's a story I, I heard where when Bi when McCarthy first comes into the Oval Office to negotiate over a debt ceiling deal, and McCarthy's just been elected speaker, and he comes in and Biden has the aides clear the room, and he wants to sit and talk to McCarthy one-on-one -on -one to get, get take a measure of him to see what his bottom line was in terms of policy, and also to see if he could come up with a theory for what McCarthy actually wanted what he needed in order to be to, to give biden what biden needed and so he sized the guy up and he's like oh this guy is a total rookie he's like i he he he's just revealed to me in our first conversation what his bottom line was which was not raising taxes and he could see that what he needed was to assert some measure of control so that he would have some sense of authority with his own people and so biden mm -hmm. intentionally at this early stage, it's like, okay, McCarthy can be the one who walks to the end of the White House driveway and talks to reporters and briefs reporters about what's happening. And he can explain the negotiations however he wants to them in public. Biden decided that he was going to stay silent during this whole process. He wasn't going to have his staff really 
give a whole lot of color commentary as things went along. Meanwhile, his theory was like, if he could give McCarthy that sense of security and self-confidence that Biden would be able to uh, take him to the cleaners on policy because Biden understood policy much better than he did. And indeed, like he was able to get out of this debt ceiling thing without any of the drama that pushed the nation to the brink as it did during the, the Obama administration. Okay, I want to talk about Israel and foreign policy and then get yeah. into the, his signature domestic achievements. And um, you say that he sees foreign policy less like a game of three-dimensional chess and more like family dynamics, like trying to persuade a pain in the ass uncle uh, to stop drinking so much. Um, and then you have a section where you're talking about his relationship with Benjamin Netanyahu as your hug as his hug BB strategy. So he believes, or he did believe in the last uh, campaign against uh, Gaza in 2000, that he wanted to smother Netanyahu with friendship and soothe his and Israel's anxiety that they're not alone. Yeah. So I guess kind of like a, a dad or a therapist or whatever, does he still view Netanyahu that way? And, and is that still his strategy? So that was 2021. Um, in May of 2021, he started. He was in the way. He was in the way. As he came in with this sense that he really didn't want the Middle East to consume his presidency, um, and so he he he's, he was learning lessons from the Obama administration. I think he felt like Obama overinvested in the Middle East peace process without any realistic sense of how he could achieve it given the circumstances in the world. And I think so. He decided that wasn't going to be his priority when he was president, and also he wanted to pivot towards focusing on Asia. And so uh, Gaza starts, the Hamas starts firing rockets on Israel, and suddenly he's he's drawn into this thing. And he gets the aides in the room, and he says, listen, I know what the old playbook is. The playbook is, is that we send the Secretary of State into the region to begin brokering a ceasefire, and we immediately start playing, putting pressure on the Israelis. And he said he wasn't going to do that this time. And I think there are two things that were at play. One was Joe Biden, I think, is he's maybe you could argue whether he's the last politician or not. You could also argue he's the last Zionist, that Joe Biden really does believe in Zionism. And I think it's evident from his public appearances, but it's also it was it was something that he grew up with. I mean, in one of his the stories that are kind of a little bit hard to believe, he says that his father would talk about the Holocaust and he would talk about the necessity of Israel. And he would say, if Israel hadn't been invented, we would need to invent it. And so that was something that made a huge impression on Biden very early on. Um, another kind of funny parentheses is the first time Nancy Pelosi told me the first time she met Joe Biden in 1973, Joe Biden had come out to San Francisco and he was going to go fundraising for Israel by going to sh from shoal to shoal. And Nancy Pelosi uh, was then you know, not a politician. She was a self-described housewife. And she lent Biden her Jeep so that somebody could drive Biden around San Francisco as he was raising money for Israel. And he uh, so so that happens. And so Biden, Biden's attitude was, listen, I out of both friendship and also just emotional intelligence. I know that when Israel gets attacked, the thing that they need from me as a friend is a sense of reassurance. And that as I go along, I'm going to play this almost Socratic role. And so I have these accounts where he would just be talking to Bibi, and it wasn't dictating to Netanyahu. It was like asking him questions in order to elevate certain strategic issues that Netanyahu wasn't focusing on and that he felt as kind of the big brother in the relationship, he could tease out of Netanyahu. But he also knew that there was going to be a moment where he would need to take all of the emotional capital that he would banked with Netanyahu and with the Israeli public and then spend it down by very privately telling the Israelis, listen, you've accomplished what you said you were going to accomplish here. There's nothing more that you can do. You're going to start to overstep if you go any farther. You've, in fact, the phrase that, that he used in 2021 was, he told Bibi, hey, man, you're out of runway here. And that's what got Bibi to sign on to a ceasefire in 2021. But do you think that he's going to say that now, or he's on the verge of saying that now to Bibi again? 
I mean, I think what you see him doing is uh, almost from the start, he's been, he's, he's told the Israelis, he's like, look, I am with you. And here's my warning to you about kind of how you could potentially overplay your hand, like the way that we did after 9-11. And I'm suggesting to you that you just need to keep that in front of mind. And then he goes into the war cabinet and he's like, this, this war he has so much more ownership over than I think almost any president has ever had in an Israeli conflict. He, he's actually in the Israeli war cabinet discussing strategy with him. I, I think he's doing it in the same vein initially where it's Socratic questions that help shape their thinking. I think it was a, played a very important role early on when Israel was so dazed by the events of October 7th and didn't quite know how to frame its objectives or to think about what a military operation might look like. I think he played a role in shaping that. And now you get to this moment where it's not that he's saying, step in and do a ceasefire. He's saying, look, you need to reformulate your military campaign here so that you, uh, you're you not you're not engaged in the um, the mass bombing campaigns and that you focus very much more sharply on the much more difficult exercise of eliminating Hamas leadership and also just finishing the job of eliminating the tunnels. And so I think he, what he's done is kind of similar to 2021. He banked the emotional capital, he stood by them, and now he's giving them strategic guidance. And in some ways, he's doing it out of out of love more than anything else, where he's like, this is this is the smartest path that you can take. And he's clearly paid at least some political price for standing with Israel in the way that he has, especially with uh, young voters. Yeah, that poll just came out this week. And so with young voters, three quarters say they don't, they disapprove of him. And, and then kind of amazingly, these young registered voters now say they'd vote for Donald Trump by six points. I mean, they say that now, but you know, it's still a remarkable turnaround from when they were backing Biden by 10 points just a few months ago. So how important is this issue for him when he's, as he's seeking re-election, do you think? You know, I think that I've heard people evoke comparisons to Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam, which I don't think is the case. I mean, I think this is a much, A, it's a smaller conflict. B, you do not have um, American boots on the ground. C, it's going to be over, I think, you know, uh, within the next couple months. And so it's not going to be an ongoing war as he runs for re-election. I think he does have a challenge, though, which is that it's not just this issue. This issue exists within a constellation of issues where parts of his base feel frustrated with him. And um, part of me feels like this is it's kind of there's not just the lunacy that you might have young progressive voters sitting this one out because of because of the because of Gaza while Trump erects, you know, concentration camps for for, for deporting um, migrants in mass. Um, it's Biden actually has been by most measures, the most object, the most progressive president, maybe in American history. Certainly, I think you you would argue compared to Clinton and Obama, he's been more progressive than they have. There's, um, you know, labor labor unions are experiencing a renaissance right now. You have the UAW stealing its deal. You have the prestige of unions increasing. And he was the first president to walk a picket line. He intervened in the Amazon uh, uh, union uh, drive. Um, you have all the ways in which he's gone in a different economic direction from Clinton and Obama as it relates not just to labor, but to trade, to the questions of monopoly, uh, to the questions of industrial policy. He's passed this massive climate change legislation, which has seemed to get him zero credit with the voters who care most about climate change. And he's got to figure out a way to bridge that divide. It's a little bit, it's not a mystery to me why this exists. I mean, I think the nature of American progressives have changed over time. I think that um, they're much more, they feel much more in the ascendant right now. And then whatever they get is not going to be enough, but given what they estimate to be their size and strength. But also I think the age question which will invariably 
dwell on it comes oh. into play where nobody is willing to give him credit for all of these things he's a bad character on television you know substance doesn't seem to matter in our tiktok world however the big hero for gen z is bernie sanders uh who's also old so i guess you know what I was talking, way. <laughs> yeah but I, it, it, he also seen as kind of crotchety and old and but however he's he's a big hero right um so i guess i'm wondering like why hasn't he been able to connect in that way as you say he has per- passed all of this legislation he's been more uh liberal than barack obama or bill clinton by a long shot w- when i was talking about this uh interview with my gen z kid just a few minutes ago ex- this i said the exact same thing to her when she said he's the worst president he hasn't done anything and then I tried to explain what he has done. And then the response was, well, then he needs a whole new communications team. Is that part of it that they just don't know how to sell what he's done? Yeah. I mean, clearly it's part of it. I mean, it's like they're not, people aren't buying what he's selling, even if they agree with it. And that's, but, are, but is he selling it? I guess is the question. He's not selling it. I mean, I think that and there's, why is he selling it? Um, I would say I, I can think of a couple of reasons why this hasn't connected. I mean, part of it is he is selling it. I mean, it's I think to say that he's not selling it is un, I think to, to put it that starkly would not be fair to the the them because he is out there all the time talking about things, but he doesn't he's not able to find a way to to break through credibly with voters. Um he's never been a great orator. I think as he's aged, he's become even worse order. I think that he's afraid of his own public persona to a certain extent that if you remember that uh, going back to 1987, when he got in trouble for uh, his plagiarism, for the plagiarizing and other politicians um, words that when he changed policy on gay marriage in his meet the press interview during the Obama administration, it was because he was, he was, you know, thank God he did it, but he was just, he was yapping. And I think he knows that everybody thinks of him as a gaff machine. He knows that he's always had this latent potential for saying the wrong thing. And now that he's president of the United States, I think he's, he, he genuinely tries to be extra careful about not stepping in it and yet mm. he, he has stepped in it quite a few times but he you know he's extra careful about trying not to step in it and so i think he's refrained from press conferences and interviews and i think his people all share the same fear so they keep him away from open mics as much as they can yeah i mean I'm, it's like it's not it's not as simple as they're just standing in the way of him where there's a bank of microphones confronting him. I think that he has he has self-restraint as well about this that is kind of born of hard-learned lessons that he's had over the course of his career about the um, the consequences of his speaking too freely. But I guess they could do other things like, uh, and I don't know because I'm not on TikTok, but maybe mount big campaigns on TikTok and, and all They're that. They're so, it's so annoying, uh, I think from, uh, if you were to come to them with that kind of perspective, because I mean, obviously that's what they should do. And I don't, I'm not on TikTok either, so I don't know what they're doing, but I just, my sense is that you have a lot of people who came out of, you know, who are not Joe Biden's age per se, but who've been around politics since the 1980s. And they tend to be very conventional in their approach to political campaigns. And so their their instinct is let's buy a lot of ads on television, even if no one's watching. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That, uh, to people who care about being Donald Trump, that might be a very depressing thought. But do you true. think he can win? Yeah, of course. I mean, I don't. He will I'm win. Scared? Yeah. No. I, I. I mean, I as I'm scared that he won't win. I think there's a very real prospect that he won't win. The polls are the polls, and. When you listen to people, I mean, you described your Gen Z daughter being so disconnected from the best parts of what he's done. And I'm sure that she's better informed and better than, you know, anybody, you know, others in her age cohort. And so that's a huge problem. I think that when you listen to people describe his age as their the fundamental issue, I sometimes wonder if that's not just an excuse that people wield for saying that they want to vote for Donald Trump. 
because there's something, some nostalgia that they have for Donald Trump. But how do you disprove that you're not you that you're 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 too old for the job? Like you can't demonstrate uh, kind of virility and activity and energy in a way that's going to convince anybody otherwise. I mean, he went to Israel. And, and, you know, he flew overnight to go to Israel. He's in marathon meetings in Israel where he's in the middle of a crisis and nobody changed their opinion about his age based on a performance like that, which at least for now should, I mean, if you're voting on his age right now, that was as pretty good a refu refutation as you could muster. And in your dealings with him, what is your impression in terms of his acuity and his in you know his age mentally yeah. so i think that he uh so one of the the problems with keeping him locked up is that people can't see how he actually functions in the moment and so i would say if you listen to him talk about his strategy in uh, for countering china you would be you'd be really impressed. You'd be like, this guy has totally got it. Like he's able to move around and look at the pieces on the chessboard and say, we're doing this in Australia, we're doing this in the Belt and Road Initiative. I've just done this with India, and I brought South Korea and China and, and uh, South Korea and Japan together for the first time since World War II. And it's you're like, oh, this guy actually has a real global strategy. He can articulate it in a very sharp sort of way. And then there are other moments which you would see. I think everybody does see where he's asked a question and he gets lost in a story about Jesse Helms's funeral or something. And you're like, Oh boy, like he's, he's like, he's not following the through line here. I mean, I think he was maybe always susceptible to that kind of meandering um, answer and getting uh, being too besotted by his own, um, his own skills as a recantor. Um, but so, so here's what I would say. If you ask me, could he, Nikki Haley has said every president should take a mental acuity test. Would he pass it right now? I'd say he'd ace it. He'd do just fine. If he was an 86 year old president, which is the prospect of that we'd face with his reelection, I couldn't tell you that he would do that well when he was 86 years old. I don't know how he's going to age. And clearly he's, I mean, there's one thing that we know. You know, Joe Biden will be four years older and that, you know, he'll be four years, um, you know, somehow slower than he is now. Mm -hmm. But can I just say one other thing on this uh, that just uh, I find um, is a mistake that the, my colleagues in the press make quite frequently is that the idea of mental acuity, right? So getting lost in a story is different than being a lunatic. But this question of mental acuity gets placed on a spectrum where it's like, oh, Donald Trump, he might be kind of, he might be bad shit crazy, but that's the same thing as Joe Biden forgetting a name sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, the the whole, I, I don't know why the age um, micro, uh, microscope has not been placed as much on Donald Trump. Right. I mean, you could argue, I mean, because... Donald Trump is all like the Donald, Donald Trump as he presents now, you know, he, he's whatever, whatever is, you know, not right, you know, upstairs or whatever, whatever issues he has, he still presents as vigorous. And hmm. so people age differently right. and they show their age in different ways. Okay, let's talk about some of these big uh, legislative policies that he's enacted that nobody seems to know anything about. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I, I want you to tell the story of how Build Back Better, which was a massive um, attempt to enact a lot of social policies uh, that the left would have loved. Uh, it failed mainly because of Joe Manchin. Yes. Um, and you write that it failed largely I mean, there were a lot of things building up to this, but it all culminated in he, him being irked over a press release that singled him out. Tell yeah. us that story. Yeah. So um, I'll start even a little bit further back than that. At the end of October, uh, Joe, Joe Biden invites Joe Manchin to his house in Delaware. 
And one of the most fundamental things about Joe Biden is that he's 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 status anxious. Like Scranton Joe is like intent on showing the world that he's smart and that he's made it. And he built this house on a lake in Delaware. And it's kind of the pride of pride, pride and joy. It was this like white elephant project. He was engaged in a lot of DIY projects, but he's never used it as a theater in the presidency. And so he's about to, in his mind, close the deal with Joe Manchin on this massive piece of legislation that would transform the social safety net and include all the climate provisions that ultimately passed. And so he figures, all right, I'm going to charm the socks off of Joe Manchin by having him come. And he gives him this forever tour of his estate. And he sits down with him and he's going through the issues and his wife, Jill Biden, really cares about free community college. And Joe Biden knows Manchin's never going to deliver on this, but he's like, okay, I'm going to press this guy one last time on these things for Jill Biden, for all the, you know, for the people in Congress who were care. And so he goes through this list and he gets to the end of it and he and Joe Manchin shake hands and Manchin tells him, I'm going to, I'm going to help you get this done, Mr. President. And they weren't totally there on details, but in the old fashioned world of Joe Biden, where your word is as good as your bond and your handshake is like Oak or whatever the cliches are, this was a really important moment. And so flash forward, that's late October, infrastructure bill passes the house. So he's got his one big win there and they're negotiating the final details of tax increases and which provisions are going to have to fall out when they because they don't have quite enough revenue to satisfy um, Joe Manchin and Manchin comes to the White House the week before Christmas. So uh, he comes to, and they have a great talk and Manchin leaves Biden with a sheet of paper that's kind of his bottom line and the numbers don't add up totally and, and Biden's like, OK, this is great. We're so close. Let's just leave this till, till next year. And, you know, we'll just use this to get across the finishing line because it was actually complicated. He couldn't just say yes on the spot because it would have pissed off Kirsten, Kirsten Cinema because he'd made certain promises to her. And so he had stuff to finesse. And so Biden, the next day, the Biden people are like, OK, we got to put out a press release explaining to the world what's what's happening, because they all Democrats need to know we're very close here. So they put out a rate of press release saying we're in our final stages of negotiating with Senator Manchin. We're going to finish this next year. They didn't need to send that press release to Joe Manchin, but they sent it to Joe Manchin and Manchin responds. I don't like this. You're saying you're negotiating with me and you're just putting all the spotlight on me. And he didn't like it because the left was putting all this pressure on Manchin. They were paddling up to his houseboat and, and, and shouting at him. And there'd been an incident in West Virginia at his house when his wife was alone, where she felt very insecure and it made Manchin very. And so he said, you're putting the spotlight on me and it's threatening my security. Let's change the press release to include Cinema's name so that she feels some of the heat too. And the White House response was, we're actually done negotiating with Cinema. We've got her on board. Let's just, we're just going to send this out. But they didn't, Manchin had suggested these changes. The White House ignored them and Manchin erupted volcanically. He was like, he felt betrayed. He felt like the president had broken this deal to deal with him in an honorable sort of way. And then that Sunday, he goes on Fox News and giving the White House the barest bit of heads up says, I'm pulling the deal on this. And the president had tried to reach him before he went on to try to stop him or convince him otherwise and left this like very, in my mind, sad message being like, hey, Joe, how could you do this to me? And at Christmas time, and they had a very angry conversation later that day. And it seemed like nothing was ever going to happen because the relationship between the White House and Manchin erupted so profoundly. The White House mm -hmm. put out a statement accusing Manchin of behaving dishonorably. And so flash forward to, to the last summer, and nobody sees a compromise coming. And lo and behold, they're able to pass this massive bill that's the biggest, most important piece of legislation combating climate change, maybe like, certainly in our history, maybe in the history of the world, and making all Inflation these reduction act. Yeah. All these investments to hasten the arrival of a clean energy economy 
which actually is arriving much faster than anybody anticipated. But okay, but it's stripped of all of the social safety net stuff, the totally lead, the the free college, the child tax credit, all of that stuff yeah. is gone. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, A, why did they send out that press release if they knew that that would piss him off? And B, I guess the bigger question is, was he just using that as a fig leaf because he didn't want to go ahead with this anyway? Yeah. Um, well, obviously a mistake in retrospect, but I think that your analysis is probably the right one, which is that Manchin never really wanted to spend all this money um, in a redistributive sort of way. He didn't like expanding the social safety net. He was going along because he felt like he had some obligation to his party. Parentheses, it's interesting that Joe Biden, Joe Manchin, despite flirting with no labels, hasn't actually left the Democratic Party yet. He's got some vestigial relationship that actually seems to matter to him, which is one reason why I kind of doubt he's going to run on as the no, no labels candidate. So it was a big, it's a big mistake. I don't know if anything different would have actually changed the course of history. And it was as a legislative strategy, you got to give the Biden people marks for chutzpah. Like with one vote margin in the Senate, they were about to spend $3.5 trillion, not just doing the biggest climate change legislation, but creating all of these new programs, universal, day, you know, creating daycare, universal kindergarten, elder care um, that would have really transformed the safety net in the way that you described. So he has a portrait of FDR in his office, in, in the White House Medical Office. So is that who he models, his, wants to model his presidency after? I think uh, at the very optimistic beginning it was. And um, the, you know, the thing that is so unexpected about Joe Biden and the way that this, the last, these two years unfold is that Biden was somebody who everybody thought was a very cautious weather bane, And he was willing to do big and ambitious things and risk catastrophic failure, which did happen to him on the way to his successes. This is also part of the reason why I think he struggles to get credit is when you start off saying, all right, I'm, I want to accomplish this massive thing. And then you end up accomplishing something that's massive, but not nearly at the scale that you initially set out to do. It doesn't look like a success or it doesn't feel like a success in that sort of way. And, it, and I guess the average American doesn't feel it because the what the benefits of it aren't going to be realized for a while because it's in investing in infrastructure and green energy and jobs and like and considering also the chips act and the infrastructure act like these big big huge pieces of legislation are going to pay off 10 20 30 years from now uh, some of them are i would say are actually paying off now but they're just not being the, the benefits aren't being felt or distributed so you had all of this capital sitting on the sidelines during the pandemic, and it's now getting poured into um, th these big investments in the construction of plants. So you have semiconductor plants getting built in Arizona and Georgia, which are massive things that will have big economic ramifications. There's something that's called the battery belt that's been built across the American South because the nature of the supply chains that you need in order to do something like make the batteries that go into electric vehicles requires all of these interlocking parts to exist in close proximity. And one guy's one 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 firm is not going to build a plant without knowing that the, the the next plant in the supply chain is also coming online so that this intricate structure exists. And so you need the coordinating hand of government, which is, you know. I think the, the, the thing that they're never going to get any credit for is kind of the technocratic bravura that is on display in the implementation of these programs, or it was in display in the implementation of the pandemic response where you had the vaccine rollout where government was able to ramp up the production of Pfizer, which did not take Operation Warp Speed money. Trump doesn't get credit for Pfizer. They were able to ramp up the workhorse vaccine, they were able to come up with a plan very quickly to get shots in arms so that within six months of coming into office, you could stroll into Walgreens or CVS and get a shot that would save your life. It really was one of the greatest, most important government programs of all time. 
and now it's quickly forgotten. I know. Well, we all wanted to have a president we wouldn't have to pay attention to every day, every minute of every day. And now we have one and we don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, is um, I, My first boss in journalism was uh, Michael Kinsley, and he had a book called Big Babies. And it's like people, people, <laughs> you know, the public public opinion is so fickle, like you described. Okay, um, before we go to the viewer questions, I want to just touch on Afghanistan and the news that you broke in your book about Hillary Clinton in this, in the whole fiasco of the withdrawal. And Hillary Clinton, who was not in the government at all, but had maintained strong relations with women in Afghanistan and had several NGOs that she sponsored there. Um, when this whole thing was happening, the Taliban were closing in on Kabul, got it what she called a kill list of over 100 women who would be killed by the Taliban because they were in prominent positions. And then she organized a, an evacuation of them. Um, and they were to wear white scarves so that they would be recognizable to the American military who was helping with the evacuation. So can you tell us first how she organized that and how successful it was and, and how she did or did not work with the Biden administration on that? So um, when the kill list arrives, she starts going to Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan, people who she's worked with for a long time, saying, I hear these women are going to get killed. You need to do something. And she would ask them very tough questions about the plans that they had for. And she realized that they weren't planning for a humanitarian evacuation. And so she needed to do one on her own. And so this network of NGOs she she started um, began to get um, safe houses in Kabul and contingency plans for security, private security to get women to the airport and out of the country. And then when the crisis hits, I mean, there are very dramatic moments where her people um, are, you know, on WhatsApps, uh, you know, conversation chains with women who they've sent to the airport to, and then they get to the airport and they say, we're on Hillary Clinton's list. And the Marines there are like, what Hillary Clinton's list? And so these women don't get through and they're, it was one woman who was sitting in a restroom of a gas station and she's texting Hillary Clinton's aides furiously, you know, the Taliban are outside this restroom. What do I do? And so it looked like things were going very, very badly, but then they end up negotiating. Hillary Clinton does all this private diplomacy. She calls the Emir of Qatar and arranges for motorcades to take these women to the airport. And the women, and then she calls uh, the prime minister of Albania and finds a place for them to get resettled. But there's a moment when the Taliban don't believe that these women actually have visas to get into Albania. And so she had somebody on the ground in Tirana, the capital of Albania, in the foreign ministry, and they create a PDF that they could show to the Taliban that looks like a visa. And the Clinton aides like, this doesn't look official enough. We need a QR code. And there was a bag of potato chips there. So they took a picture of the potato chips bag with the QR code, sent it in this PDF in order to fake out the Taliban. And there are about there, there are over a thousand Afghans who were who made it to Albania who wouldn't have gotten out if not for uh what Hillary Clinton was able to in her wow. NGOs were able to pull off. Amazing. And so what was the reaction? I mean, she wasn't doing this within the government. What was her reaction on the part of the White House? They did, they were not too pleased with her. That uh, there was this phone call where she was talking to Jake Sullivan. And uh, well, so Jake Sullivan calls her up. Uh, Hillary Clinton had talked to uh, the Ukrainians because she wanted to get access to a Ukrainian plane. And Sullivan called her up and said, what the hell are you doing talking to the Ukrainians? And she said, "Well, I wouldn't have to do that if I wouldn't have to do that if you were doing your, if you were doing your job, more or less." Wow. And, and he was her protege, right? Yeah, yeah, very testy. What did Joe Biden think of this? I think Joe Biden actually, when it came to his attention, what was what was happening, I think he became pretty. So Biden makes a decision after the horrible scenes from the airport where. We're going to do a full-blown humanitarian evacuation. He didn't want any C-17s to leave Hamid Karzai Airport, 
with with empty seats. So he he said, "We'll vet these people later, but let's get them on the planes and out of out of uh, out of Kabul." But I think he was very closely following what was happening to the 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 white scarves, these Clinton groups, and was asking questions about what what was happening to them because he would get Biden, who I think was pretty cold hearted about the Afghans as he made the decision to withdraw as he could see kind of the human suffering and as he could see the political cost he was play, paying became much more focused on the details. And just as an illustration of the way in which Biden is so much more detail oriented and wonky than he gets credit for, he was sitting there pouring over maps of Kabul and he would be on the, the video conference line with the acting ambassador in Kabul and other people on the ground and say like why don't you use this parking lot here as a meeting spot and so he would ask these very specific questions which didn't yield usually yield the right answer but would prod people to make sure that they weren't overlooking the obvious and he's never expressed regret over what of withdrawing from Afghanistan no. or the way it was handled I think he's um no, he's not. I mean, I think he's kind of fudged it a little bit where he said it was inevitable that the withdrawal would be messy. But the problem with that argument is that he never told anybody that in advance. And so he may be right. It was always going to be messy, but you can't you can't just after the facts be like, oh, man, this was always going to be messy. Uh, I didn't really fail because it was already an inherent failure because we'd failed at 20 years of nation building. Okay, let me get to a couple of questions. Eric asks, Biden has taken a lot of criticism about our border. Even Hispanics don't like his policies. Why can't he do something about the border crisis? So um, I write about this in the book. I think that Biden is attuned to the issue of immigration in a way that probably meshes much more closely with um, the center of public opinion than some of the progressives on his staff who deal with immigration policy. So there's that gap there. But I think um, there are a couple of problems. One is there's actually a limit to what any president of the United States can do as it relates to actually the, the, the what they call the chaos at the border, because it has to do with uh, crises in Central America and it has to do with the tight labor market in the United States. And so you just have people who are um, kind of desperate and also magnetically, you know, almost magnetically drawn to, to our border. And I don't think that toughening up in the way that um, has been suggested, you know, some of these could be very good policy options that should be pursued because they're better policy. But I don't think we should think that they're going to instantly solve whatever problem exists at the border. But he is, is he carrying out some of Trump's policies at the border when it comes to deportation or even holding kids in, in detention? Yeah, he's been, I mean, this is, you're, you're correct that um, I think he's reformed some of the harshest edges of Trump's policy on uh, on on immigration, um, certainly when it comes to treating immigrants in the interior of the country, he's much, much he's much more humane than Trump mm -hmm. was. But when it comes to the border itself, he's been a bit of a hawk on a lot of these issues. He kept Trump policies in place much longer than progressives would have liked, and it didn't really have the beneficial effect of tamping down border crossings or migration or all of the asylum claims. Um, okay, here's a Kamala question, double question actually. Sheila and Stephen and others ask, will Biden consider a different running mate than Kamala Harris? And how do you feel, I guess you, this is from Steve, about having Vice President Kamala Harris become president if Joe Biden cannot carry out his duties? Um, I think that there's, more of a chance of Biden dropping out of the race than replacing Kamala Harris. I just think that it's it's something very hard for me to imagine because um, he doesn't really fire people uh, very often. 
I can't think of instances in this administration where he's fired people. He also has um, a sense of presidential, what the president's loyalty to the vice president should look like based on his own experience as vice president. So I think it would be hard for him to get to a place like that. I think he'd feel he'd feel bad about doing it in a way that would probably stop him from doing it. I think Kamala Harris, um, in some ways, the the critique of her has hardened into this caricature that I think is not totally in sync with reality. So uh, her communication skills as a political messenger are like, are, are not any better than his, obviously, <laughs> you know, she has a lot of the same issues that he has where she's so afraid of making a mistake that she ends up talking herself into cul-de-sacs and, I think that she struggled to have a strong um, sense of herself in the job, which is uh, until arguably the the Dobbs decision drops, and I think she has a much uh, much clearer sense of what her mission is in the administration. But wasn't very, she supposed to handle immigration? So she was supposed to handle the root causes of migration, which meant dealing with Central America. And oh. to me, this is actually a kind of emblematic thing where it's a very hard job. Joe Biden had that that job himself when he was vice president. It ends up meaning that the border gets kind of border problems could very easily be attributed to you by your political enemies. And I think that she was initially very enthusiastic about that task. But then when it became clear that everybody in Washington said this is a horrible job, she began to back away from it and began to talk herself into corners. I think she had an opportunity to grind out real accomplishments by sticking to some of these issues in Central America, which have very little glory attached to them. But instead, she kind of, I think, a bit scampered away from the whole issue. What is the nature of the relationship? Because when he was vice president, Barack Obama really relied on him for his foreign policy expertise. What is the nature of their their relationship? So the problem is, is that Joe Biden doesn't believe that he needs to have anybody (laughs) <laughs> compensate for his weaknesses because he believes he's been around so long that he doesn't have any of these gaps in his resume. He treats her with the formal respect that he feels that uh, Barack Obama never uh, aff- afforded him. So he refers to her as the vice president as opposed to my vice president, which is Obama's phrase for Biden, which made him feel like he was kind of a pet of some sort. And so he's very careful to make sure that she gets looped into everything. And yet the lunches they were supposed to have every week ended up falling to the side and they don't have, you know, she, she's in every meeting. She, she's extraordinarily well prepared. She asks, she asks very smart questions. She prepares as if it's a trial for everything, which means that she spends a lot of time preparing, but, but it, 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 it pays off in the questions she asks, but I would say, It's interesting how she and Biden and their insecurities end up defining their, um, they end up overcompensating for their insecurities and their weaknesses, and that doesn't necessarily lead them to the best political place. Okay, finally, let me just ask you a um, popularity question. He's polling, as we've mentioned, in the 30s, upper 30s, which is pretty dismal. And so privately, does the White House team Biden, do they really worry that he's not going to win? Or are they kind of thinking, ah, we did it before. I'm the dragon slayer. Okay, the polls are bad now. But in the final analysis, they're not going to choose this guy over Biden. Um, I really do think that there's this tautology that they believe. like Just because we've been written off before and end up surri- surprising everybody, we'll be able to do it again. But just because it worked once doesn't mean that it'll work again. And if you go back and you look, Joe Biden's failed a bunch of times when people have underestimated him. <laughs> you know, it's like he didn't win the 2008 Democratic primary. He didn't win the 1988 Democratic primary. So he could still very easily fail. And I don't think that they, to me, you know, I, I think they know it's going to be tight. And I think they know there's a chance they're going to lose. But if I was in there, I'd be in football and panic mode, and I don't sense that they are. 
Okay, well, that's a good enough note as any to end on. <laughs> Happy <Panic> New Year! <laughs> How to end the whole year on. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> the book is fantastic. Here it is. Go get it as a pre Christmas present, whatever, Kwanzaa present, whatever it is. Um, the Last Politician, Franklin Ford, thank you so much for joining us today on our last thank you. Uh, episode of the year. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us and join us again in the new year, January 3rd. We will have the former Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen, in conversation with Warren Olney. Thank you so much for being here. Happy and safe holidays. And I will see you again in the new year.